Takia Blackman. Good morning, and welcome to the Professional Pastors, and this is Ms. Diane Wimbush, your show host, and we're thankful that you tuned in with us today on the broadcast. Don't forget about our um, upcoming Women Empowerment Luncheon that will be held on um, Saturday, June the 15th, 2019. It will begin at 10 o'clock a.m., and it will be held at the Admiralty Inn Banquet Suites. Hall, and that's located at 8181 Highway 51 uh, South, and that's Millington, Tennessee. And our guest speaker for that event will be Jill Coleman. So for all other upcoming events, you can go to our website at www.stpetersburgglobalministries.org. So today um, we have an exciting guest that's on the panel with us today. And we're going to jump right into the show and let her um, um, tell us about her, and then we're going to learn a little bit more about her brand and the purpose as to why she created this niche for her success. So welcome to the show, Takia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about you. So I am a mental health advocate, I'm a speaker and a recent author, and I am also a suicide survivor. And so mental health was not something that was talked about growing up. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, it wasn't until I had my experience of actually attempting suicide and being forced into a place that I was always terrified of, you know, um, anytime I saw the psychiatric unit in the movies, it always was like people were in stray jackets or, you know, people were talking to themselves. I was very fearful of that. And my nightmare, uh, worst dream came true. I was actually forced into the psychiatric unit. And that's what really started my journey to wellness and rebuilding my relationship with God uh, because, when I um, reached out to my church family because I am a Christian, they didn't mm-hmm. have the tools or they didn't have the knowledge on how to help me. And so they said mm-hmm. things that really pushed me away from church and God. Mm. And, yes, their hearts were pure. They wanted to help me. They had genuine um, – They their hearts were genuine. It's just they didn't have the knowledge and the education to help me. And so I really started uh, my podcast. And really wrote my book was because I wanted to educate people to let them know that they can pray, but they can go to therapy too. And just because we go to therapy or we may need to take uh, medication for our mental health, it doesn't mean that we lack faith in God, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so just like if we break our leg, we would go to the doctor or the hospital to get an x-ray and a cast, and it's the same thing. And Mm -hmm. so... Um, and so someone told me, they said, well, your brain is an organ just like your heart. And so if your uh, heart is not together, you go to the cardiologist. If your brain is not doing well, then you may need to see a psychiatrist and a therapist. And I think I just really wanted to change people's perspective on how we talk about uh, faith and mental health. Mm-hmm. That's a, a very impactful story. Um, you know, Takia, I'm, I, I'm the first one to um, um, agree with you, or maybe the two, three hundred thousand person to agree with you <laughs> in regards to mental health. It's just something about it, um, and um, and I'm thankful that you clarify that. That does not mean that they're that church people are not pure. That does not mean that they're holy. I think that just sometimes that we don't, um, we does not, we do not um, tailor to some of the things that individuals go through behind closed doors. We are more concerned about, you know, uh, worship and things like that. But I think that Christians um, suffer a lot of depression just as much as the ones that are um, perhaps maybe non-Christians. And so um, I think you have been maybe about the third or fourth guest that have came on this year um, on the professional pastors that that has talked about um, mental health and mental awareness because there is so much that um, I think all of us face. You know, if we just all be honest, you know, uh, in that aspect, if we all be honest, all of us face some sort of uh, depression and mental illness. So in your terms, um, just your terms, from the experience that you have um, had in the past with this, what is mental illness to you? So mental illness 
It could be anything from major depressive disorder to bipolar disorder to generalized anxiety disorder to schizophrenia. It is anything that disrupts your ability to function on a daily basis. So Mm -hmm. when my diagnosis is major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, and so for me what that looked like, that looked like I was not able to take care of my hygiene, so I was in bed for days at a time. That was a a race in mind constant with suicidal thoughts. That Mm -hmm. was not having the energy to actually get out of bed, not because I was lazy. That was not eating for days at a time. So, for Mm -hmm. instance, when I arrived to the hospital, I was actually dehydrated because I haven't had anything to eat or drink in days. Um, Mm -hmm. And so anything that stops you from being able to do daily activities, to be able to live a fulfilled life, whether it's voices in someone's head, Um, or uh, delusions or hallucinations, it varies from person to person, but the common thing is that it stops you from being able to live a productive and a fulfilled life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Um, um, You know, just to um, uh, put a few little tips in there, you know, sometimes if I stay too enclosed because a lot of things that I do work on, um, whether it's um, in the studio or whether it's at home, it's, you know, kind of basically closed in. So I have to, um, um, if it's more closed in into a closed area, sometimes the depression just will come out of nowhere because you have to be able to sometimes uh, break through, you know, to be able to go somewhere else. Maybe it's go get your ice cream cone or go out and exercise or maybe go to the coffee shop or, or perhaps a local event that is being hosted um, in the area. So it's not something where it's, you know, a lot of times we feel that it's a genetic type of um, of, of a disorder, but it's not. Uh, depression can, you know, come up on you all of a sudden. Just sometimes I think you're just sitting alone by yourself, uh, you know, numerous days or numerous, you know, periods of the time. So I think that it's, you know, also good for, you know, to be able to get out and engage, um, you know, in a different type of atmosphere um, as well. So um, let's um, talk about your podcast, um, you know. And so now you shared uh, several um, uh, key factors of what you um, um, talk about and what it's all about. So, so, is, so take, for instance, like if you have a guest or you invite a guest on the show, what would the listener get from you and the guest that um, is on uh, the podcast that you have? So the podcast is really a space and a safe space, really, for people who live with any form of mental illness. Um, and I focus specifically mm-hmm. on communities of color because a lot of times we, you know, it was, it's while there is a stigma, no matter what ethnicity or background you are, for mm-hmm. people who are of, who are African American, our trauma runs deep from, you know, decades of us, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's slavery or whether it's the Jim Crow era. So, mm-hmm. so really, it's a space for people of color to say that yes, I live with bipolar disorder and Mm -hmm. I'm still able to thrive and have a productive life. And so we want people to know that they may have a diagnosis and they may be taking medication or they may be going to therapy um, and seeing their psychiatrist uh, regularly, but they're still able to live a a productive life. And that's what we want Mm -hmm. people to know, that mental illness is not a death sentence. And while, yes, your struggles may be different, and for some people it is genetic, you know, like Mm -hmm, in my case mm -hmm. it would happen to be genetic. Um, And so we want people to know that they can still live a great life. You may have to do things differently than someone who does not experience a mental illness, but that doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you can't um, live a fulfilled life. And so people will learn, you know, what people – what therapy is like because some people are afraid to attend therapy. They'll learn Mm -hmm. um, because I have talked to therapists too and therapists who actually go to therapy. Um, So they'll learn what therapy is like or um, how to find low cost and free therapy options or how to connect to peer support. Um, And really the biggest thing is I wanted people to have a place where they can hear from the consumer perspective because Mm -hmm. there are so many podcasts that are from the clinician's uh, point of view. So these are the professionals who are treating people who live with mental illness. And I wanted mm-hmm. a space where people who can say like, yeah, I struggle with something or I sometimes hear voices, and but despite my struggles with that, I'm still able to 
hold a job. I'm still able to take care of my family. Um, and so it's really the point is to just normalize the mental health conversation and making sure that people have a space where they feel like they can live in their truth. Mm-hmm. So how has this been rewarding? How has this been rewarding? You know, okay, so for example, we have all, we all have uh, different type of therapies. You know, some things are, or one thing may be therapeutic to one person and, and another type of category or genre may be therapeutic to another. So how has this been rewarding for you as well as your um, um, listeners? And what I mean by the listeners, you know, as far as testimony-wise, but how has this also been a therapeutic tool for you to be able to overcome mental illness and be able to share this with so many people around the world? So I think the biggest thing that has been rewarding is that when people are reaching out to me and they'll say, you say all the things that I want to say, but I can't say. Um, Mm -hmm. And so essentially I believe it's God allowing me to use my voice to people who feel as though they don't have a voice or they're afraid to use their voice, Um, or people reach out to me and say, wow, that's the first time I was able to be really vulnerable and share something that was very, um, that I was shameful about at at one point. And so I think that's what has been very rewarding for me um, and what has been therapeutic in a sense, not just because of the people that I'm able to connect with, But I think Mm -hmm. the biggest thing for me is that it's so freeing and it's so liberating because I'm a person now who I don't feel ashamed for the things that have happened to me or the things that I've gone through. I believe I went through it for a reason, and I've learned from it. And so I'm in a space now where I'm very comfortable in my skin, and it took a long time for me to get there. And I think Mm -hmm. because of that, um, being able to own my truth, as I like to say, um, it's given – permission for other people to do the same. And mm-hmm. I think that has what has been the most um, therapeutic part for me. Um, but it didn't, you know, didn't start there. It took uh, years of therapy before I was able to get to that space. But I think mm-hmm. that has been one of the most rewarding things. And from that, you know, the podcast grew, um, you know, a book that I recently wrote on my life. Um, mm-hmm. And just even the feedback from the book, you know, there are people who are twice my age, and they're mm-hmm. reaching out to me and saying, you know, I read the first few pages and I'm crying already. And that mm-hmm. alone is a blessing to me because that means that people are getting the permission to actually start their healing process and knowing that there's not one way to heal. There are multiple ways to heal. and that people are actually becoming comfortable and saying, you know what, I have some work to do, and you know what, I'm going to give therapy a try. And I think that has been the most rewarding thing for me because it's given people permission to heal and start to um, own own the things that they have gone through as well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, let's see how I can be able to, um, I guess, um, um, I don't know how I can be able to say this. What about when others um, may overlook the fact that there is a mental, you know, sometimes individuals may be in denial of a mental illness. So, for example, um, let me give a a, a real true story of a, a mother that had many, many children. And so... Um, Several of the, I think it was some mental, you know, some mental illness um, genetically that was going on um, in the uh, family and, and and with her too. But she, you know, she was still be able to function. It was just like sometimes you can have uh, knowledge, but you don't have the common sense knowledge. So it was somehow it fell on several of the other children. But 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 what are your per, percept, perceptions? on when we overlook the fact, how can that be damaging to an individual or to the next generation if we do not take hold of that disorder? You know, I think the biggest thing, the first thing that comes to mind for me is generational curses because Mm. there has been, so for instance, I had a perfect example. When I got out of the hospital for attempting to end my life, I spoke to my grandfather uh, my my paternal grandfather, and he mm-hmm. told me, he said, 
Well, when I was 14, I actually attempted to end my life, and also your great uncle uh, struggles with schizophrenia, and we just had to have him committed to the um, to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And I and immediately I thought, well, why didn't someone talk to to me about this um, as I was growing up? Just as mm-hmm. would talk about sex, we would talk about education and going to college. Why wasn't mental health a part of the conversation too? Um, and I think that when we don't have those conversations and we sweep things under the rug or people are mm-hmm. in denial, what it does is it not only perpetuates the stigma for mental health, but it also continues the cycle and that brokenness and sometimes mental illness is often you see it um, progressing from generation to generation. And so if we don't actually call it what it is, whatever the diagnosis is or whatever that trauma is, um, because we know, you know, mental illness, it could be genetic. It could be from a trauma. Maybe someone has, you know, been raped or maybe someone was in, um, a te- they, you know, grew up in poverty. No matter what it is, there's so many variables and factors that go into mental illness. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing is, if we, if we don't address it, it will just continue the cycle. And then before you know it, you have generations of broken people. And so I think that's the biggest thing that comes to mind for me because I believe that God is using me and my family to be a generational curse breaker. Um, I watched my mom also be um, verbally and physically abused, and my mom also um, was diagnosed with a post-traumatic stress disorder as well as major depressive disorder. And my father, unfortunately, you know, he was in and out of jail and he struggled with substance use um, disorder. And so mm-hmm. you have the combination of both of my parents and then you have me and I, and I'm of course a makeup of both of them. And so, um, um, you know, the blessing in that is that I have been able to address how my mother, um, you know, situation and my father's situation, how it's impacted me, and I've been able to heal from it because I've been able to talk about it and address it and work through those things. But if we don't talk about it, then you will find that then it will be another generation who will continue it and will say, oh, just because my mom has did it this way or my father has did it always this way, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we actually hold the space for people to talk about the things that are bothering them and that's contributing to their brokenness and their ability to not function at their maximum capacity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I absolutely agree. That is um, a very um, um, detailed uh, um, description um, of what you just gave. Um, even with that, uh, back to the mother um, that I was um, um, sharing with you earlier um, and with the listeners about uh, you know, sometimes we can have children, um, and we don't talk about it, we don't discuss it, we don't bring it up, and then um, all of a sudden, um, Alzheimer's set in on other um, family members as well. Uh, you know, when they get older, which I still feel that that's a uh, a form of a uh, some type of mental disorder um, as mm-hmm. well, because it deals with the mind. Um, and so, um, even with the children that she had, I think it was like five of them that were basically mental. Um, on the outside, but the other ones, they possessed uh, right now, they still possess professional jobs in the works, uh, you know, in the corporate America and all of that, but there is still some, um, you know, mm-hmm. um, when having a conversation with them. See, so what I'm trying to say is sometimes mental illness can be hidden. You Mm -hmm. you can't detect it on a doctor. You can't detect it Mm -hmm. on a nurse. It's only when you be able to sit down and communicate with the individual and you're like, okay, then you're you're not really actually different than from your older brother. You're basically the same. It's just you're you're able to come out and... uh, uh, I don't know how to uh, use the term. You're able to overcome it in some aspects, but it's still a little touch of it on all of the children. I think the lady had about 15, and so it's still a touch there on every last one of them. It's just Mm -hmm. like half of them are, uh, are, are, you know, you can tell it on the outside and the other portion of them, they have the real high prestigious jobs and things like that, but it's not until you be able to sit down and communicate and you'll say, yeah, it's still there too. It's with you as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's important, too, that people understand that 
even if they don't have, let's say, a mental health diagnosis, we all still have mental health just like we Mm -hmm. have physical health. And it's important that we do those things to take care of our mental health because if not, then that's sometimes where you do get the mental illness because we're not taking care of our mental health. And people sometimes, it's easy, like you said, to mask it. So for myself, I think because I remember when I was in the psychiatric unit and I told the lady who was there, I said, I don't belong here. She said, what do you mean you don't belong here? I said, I have a master's degree from Georgetown University. I said I have a bachelor's from Howard University. And people like me, so in my mind, I was too educated to be there Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I didn't think I fit the description of what a person who's mentally ill should look like. So I Mm -hmm. removed myself from actually thinking that I needed that help when I actually did need need the help. So sometimes you can look at someone and you may we may limit it to the person walking down the street talking to themselves. But as you stated, yes, it can be a corporate executive, um, an entrepreneur, um, a pastor. It can be anyone, um, mm-hmm. and we're not able to see it from the outside looking in, but behind closed doors. Those people are really struggling, and so that's why I think it's important that we do not associate our our job or our education or our socioeconomic status to whether we're struggling mentally or not. Because mental illness, um, it doesn't it doesn't discriminate, um, no matter what color or um, what you are. And so I think it's important that people know that yes, there are people who have who are extremely successful. Um, For instance, perfect example, Jennifer Lewis, I was blessed and fortunate to actually speak with her on my podcast. And she battles, you know, the legendary Jennifer Lewis, singer, author, actress. Um, She battles with bipolar disorder, and she's been Mm -hmm. very vocal about what it's like to live with bipolar disorder. And so here's someone who's extremely successful but also struggles with mental illness. And so I think people know that, again, it's not a death sentence, but it's also something that we we have to address our mental health just like we go to the gym all the time. You know, there have been instances I also spoke to someone. She said that this guy, he was very fit. He trained in the gym all the time because he loved the the gym. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. as he was preparing for a, um, a bodybuilding competition, he actually took his own life. So oh. that's to, sh- to show that, you know, a person can look like they have it all together from the outside, but that doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean that. And so I think it's important that we take the time to address our mental health. Um, and, you know, n- no matter what it is, for some people, you know, it can be working out. For other people, it is spending time with their family. That helps them feel balanced. But I think the biggest thing is going beneath the surface and actually dealing with the hurt and the trauma and anything that we try to suppress or we try to forget that it's not really there because that's the thing that's going to stop us from being able, I believe, to walk in to what God has for us. We really have to go beneath the surface and go to those areas that are uncomfortable, but that's where our healing and that's where our liberty is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is absolutely true. Um, I am uh, trying to log on to try to find, um, I don't know, I don't want to say the wrong thing because it's, this podcast is uh, is live, but it was an actress. They just had her in the media um, a few weeks ago, and I think one of her triggers, I think she had just got out of the mental health place, and I think one of her um um, issues were that I think a, a couple of years ago she went in and she shaved her head. Um, I can't think of her name. I don't even think it, I don't know if it's Taylor Swift. I'm not for sure who it was, but I know I was um, watching that. And I think that mental health continues to grow. It continues to grow, but now it's even um, 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 surfacing in the church you know, so to speak. You know, we hear it on television. We hear about the agencies and the clinics that you can be able to go to. You know, they advertise it on the media, uh, on the commercials. But when it comes to church, I think that is something that we really need to look at as to how we can be able to bring in. It's not our job to know everything as Christian leaders. We can bring in the help and the support Mm -hmm. inside of the church and let the person come in and talk to them, you know, and 
gonna and I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna let you elaborate on some things in just a minute. We're gonna talk uh, talk about um, your book in just a, in the next segment. But right now, uh, you know, I was um, thinking about. You know, I think it, it was this individual that, uh, you know, that was in the church. And sometimes, like you state, sometimes we we take it and we we push it up under the rug. It's not so. This is not. And, and, and so this one um, pastor, she's a, a female, and so she was trying to go out and empower women and impact women. And when I would go to um, her ministry, I saw so much outwardly outwardly shown and displayed mental health in the church and I wanted to say so you know so uh, uh, I did I wanted to say it abruptly look lady you don't need to be out there trying to uh, make a name for yourself you need to have a health fair and bring in some partners inside of your ministry uh, mental health is the main one that you need to bring and then you need to bring some other health officials in this health fair or this uh, type of you need to hold an event a community event because it was just out there where you could be able to see it as soon as you walk inside of her um, her ministry and that is so um I guess uh, sad, I guess I can use that word, that we can sit right there and know that people are in issues. Well, we don't know it, but they're there, and we don't know that there are mental issues. We know that it's there, but we won't seek out the help for the individual. Absolutely, and I think it's important to also add that if we don't feel comfortable with going to um, therapy, but there are also Christian therapists. And I have been blessed to have, you know, a few of them. But there are therapists out there who are trained, but they're also Christian. And so you have them of the same faith, and you may feel comfortable working with someone who is of the same faith. So there are also options for uh, individuals, too. Um, So we Mm -hmm. want everyone to know that there is not one size fit all. We have to do what works best for us, and what may Mm -hmm. work best for me may not work best for you. Correct. Correct. I agree. Were you finished, or were you trying to were you trying to say something else? Oh no, that was it. Okay, okay. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about your book. Your book um, 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 that you had just released, and um, share with us and um, myself and the listeners in regards of to what is it uh, are the uh, some of the uh, takeaways that you would like for um, the readers to be able to grasp. I mean, you don't have to uh, go in detail with your chapters and things like that, but you can be able to elaborate on some of the takeaways that you would like uh, for uh, um, a potential buyer such as myself and such as the listeners and the future listeners that's going to be um, listening to the podcast. What is it that you want them to see and what is it that you want them to take away and leave? from your book. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is something that I've mentioned before is that um, it's my hope that when people are finished with the book that they begin to prioritize their mental health and realize they can pray and see a therapist. Um, and it does not mean that they lack faith in God. Um, and okay. also how your spirituality and your relationship with God can be so, it's so beneficial to your mental health. Um, they're actually not separate. Um, and so I think it's important that we you know that we don't separate the two and then we realize that our spirituality, you know, a lot of times for us there are so many I believe the statistics show that there's fifty percent of African Americans who identify um just in the United States alone as um being a Christian. And so it's important that, you know, when I, my biggest thing is that what, what people take away is that Again, you know, normalizing mental health, um, but then I also offer ways that the church can actually encourage mental health treatment and not discourage it. And so one of the examples that you brought up is like partnering with uh, mental health um, organizations or um, even having a mental health ministry. We have ministries for everything. We have ministries for people who are grieving. We have ministries for single people. Uh, We have ministries for married people, but, you know, how about a mental health ministry? Um, And so I do offer some ways that the church can actually encourage mental health treatment. Um, And another thing that I really talk about is I also talk about generational trauma and the importance of addressing it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then how I had to rebuild my relationship with God and learn to define it for myself. I can't allow, you know, my pastor or um, or another um, brother or sister in Christ to tell me what my relationship with God should look like. And I really had to take that time when I pulled away from church to rebuild my relationship with God because for a very long time I couldn't even step foot inside of a church because I was so hurt. Um, mm-hmm. And even though, yes, I knew that they meant well, it, it didn't change the fact that it really did sting. It really did leave a mark. And so, you know, when people read my book, they will, I think the biggest thing they will really start to do, I think it's like a breath of fresh air because it'll, mm-hmm. they don't, they'll say, wow, it's okay to not be okay. It's mm-hmm. okay to say, like, well, I have some things that I need to work on. And even though, yes, I'm strong in my faith with Christ, there are still some other things that I need to do to walk in the fullness that God has for me. Because sometimes we like to hear the great messages, you know, God's going to bless you, you're going into your new dimension. Mm -hmm. But sometimes (laughs) we're the ones that's preventing ourselves from going into that new dimension because Mm -hmm. we don't want to address the things address the things that we're too ashamed about or we're too embarrassed about or trauma um, that we've, um, that we've normalized. We sometimes hear about the uncle or the father who was, for instance, may have been molesting the the child and everyone's like, Oh, that's just such and such, you know, we're kind of keep it quiet. But I think Mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing that people will take away. It will give them permission to say like, you know what? It's okay to not be okay. I have some things I need to work on. And this does not mean that I lack faith in God or that my my faith is weak um, in mm-hmm. some sort of way. And so I think that's the biggest thing. And the title of my book is Saved and Depressed, A mm-hmm. Suicide Survivor's Journey of Mental Health Healing and Faith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is so awesome. Um, you know, um, even with that, this is a large uh, topic. It, 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 it usually our show actually is um, it, it cuts off at uh, at at, at uh, thirty uh, minutes, but um, we're going to extend it just for a few more minutes because it's so broad, it's so uh, sensitive. Um, individuals need to be able to come out. They need to come out. They need to um, um, listen. They need to learn. They need to have the tools and resources in regards of how they can be able to be able to um, uh, per- perfect perfect what it is that they perhaps may be challenged with. You know, and like I stated, you know, sometimes um, um, individuals can be just casting along, and they know that there is a problem, but they will not address it. And as you stated, sometimes individuals are ashamed, you know, and I've been in some situations like that before, too, have not had to take any mental health um, uh, medication or anything like that, but that's not the point. I feel that if I have some sort of depression, I'm no different than the individual that has been uh, with the straitjacket because mental health may affect all of us all uh, differently, but we still share some components of the same thing. So depression, it is real. I don't want to tell no one that depression is not real, and so my way of escaping it is, uh, you know, because like I stated, most of everything that I do, I'm a publisher as well, and I do most of a lot of things at home. And so I do a lot of things um, as well as in our studio. And so, but still, it's, it's, I don't want to uh, say it's like a claustrophobic type thing. It's just if you don't get managed the, 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 the process of how you let things come into your mind, and if we don't mm-hmm. process things of how we uh, – release certain things out of our mind, the things that we watch, you know, that's a lot of, of it too when things, you know, and so, uh, you know, I've, I've had to arrange a lot of stuff. So, you know, that's very, very important. So that's the reason why we extended the time on the broadcast to be able to give you enough time to be able to let uh, the listeners um, as well as myself, I'm going to take the information as well. I mean, I'm not too big where I can't listen and be able to relate to the content that you are uh, delivering to us on today which is so impactful and which is so um, empowerful. So um, list a couple of little things. We've got a few more questions, about three. And so list a, a few things of uh, some signs of um, a mental health illness and how can the individual, I guess that's a twofold question, how can the individual um, break through and uh, break free of uh, those certain uh, tips or signs um, that uh, may cause them to slip into the mental um, illness issue? Yes, I think the biggest thing is realizing when 
you can tell when something is wrong when it starts going against what you would normally do. So, for instance, you may find that you're staying in bed for days at a time. You may have realized you have not taken care of your hygiene um, for a week, or you may realize mm-hmm. you're rapidly gaining weight really fast or you're rapidly losing weight really fast. Mm-hmm. You're sleeping too much or you're sleeping too little. You're eating too much or you're not eating enough. So it can really, as you said, it's, it depends on the person, it's, but if it goes against what you would normally do, that's when you know it's a sign. So for me, I'm, very, I'm a very social person. I talk to people all the time, but when I was in a depressive state, I stopped talking to people. I stopped going out. I stopped eating. I wasn't taking care of my hygiene. Um, so those were things that were out of the norm for me. So if you notice mm-hmm. that yourself or a loved one is doing something that's, hmm, it's, you're like, that's a little odd. That's not something they would do. That's when you may want to check in with a mental health professional um, and, um, and seek help from a therapist. Um, there are websites like therapyforblackgirls.com where you can find a therapist. There's also organizations like the National Alliance on Mental Illness where they have free resources and you can actually – um, they have peer support groups, so the support groups are actually ran by people who live with a mental illness because I know for me sometimes there was one point, at one point in my life when I didn't feel comfortable communicating with anyone who didn't have the experience of, in my case, being in a psychiatric unit because I didn't feel like, I didn't want people to tell me, oh, you're crazy, or I wanted someone that I could connect with who had that experience. So sometimes people may need to be around someone who's had a similar experience. So NAMI is a great organization because they do advocacy, um, they do educational workshops, um, but then they mm-hmm. also host support groups. Um, finding a therapist, too, if you have insurance, contacting your insurance provider and getting a list of mental health professionals, um, that's also a great way to connect with a mental health professional. And if you should need medication, most likely your therapist will refer you to a psychiatrist because some people do need it. Um, I know for a long time I didn't want to take it because I'm like, no, it means I'm too weak. Why do I need a pill to help me to help me have the energy to take a shower or to eat? Um, Mm -hmm. But I had to tell myself if I had diabetes, I would have to take insulin. So it's the very same thing. It doesn't mean that you're weak. Um, A mental illness in some forms is a chemical imbalance in the brain. And so Mm -hmm. we have to take care of our brain um, just like we have to take care of our heart and our liver and any other organs. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the biggest thing um, if you notice, kind of going back to your question, if you notice that something is off and it's going against what you normally do, that's um, a way to kind of think to yourself, "Hmm, maybe there's something going on with myself or a loved one. And I think for a loved one, um, the biggest thing is not um, it's validating what that loved one is experiencing um, mm-hmm. because I unfortunately also lost my 14-year-old cousin to suicide. So not only mm-hmm. am I a survivor, I lost a loved one. And so I think the biggest thing when someone's going through a challenging time, you know, not to say things like, oh, you, you lack faith in God or you need to pray more or you need to read your word more because they could very well be doing those things um, and, and they may find out at, at a time that they may need more. And I think about the scripture, faith without works is dead. And so sometimes, mm-hmm. yes, we can have the faith. We can mm-hmm. have all the faith in the world, but God could very well be saying, um, you know, I need you to go to go see a therapist too. You know, we can pray mm-hmm. to God to heal us, but maybe mm-hmm. praying to God, while you heal me, can you help me find, bless me with the right therapist that I need um, who can help treat me uh, for the things that I'm dealing with. Um, and so I think that's the biggest thing um, to kind of answer your question. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's awesome. Uh, so um, in regards to that and what you have shared with us earlier um, in the broadcast in regards to um, that you had found out that there were some traits that were in your family that were um, 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 affected by um, mental disorder. So even with by you being the one that, takes a stand in the family, saying, I'm going to break this, we're going to break this cycle, I'm going to start and I'm going to try to provide resources, I'm going to get on this podcast, and I'm going to share it with the world um, as to how they can be able to become um, uh, free of this uh, disorder. How has this been um, rewarding for your family? How has they uh, taken a breath to the um, 
um, tools and resources and this uh, new uh, chapter that you have um, attached with the family. I mean, you know, it's still, you know, a part of the family because you're, you know, you're you're sharing with um, with us, uh, you know, in regards to some of the issues. So how have they taken a, a um, I guess, a step to be able to support you in this? Um, so I think, think the biggest thing and one of the most uh, things that kind of gets me emotional is, like, my mom. You know, my mom has, you know, started going to therapy, um, and my family members are now educated, and they support me because they realize I had to tell them, this is not me airing dirty laundry. I'm not trying to say that my mom is bad or my father is a bad person. or mm-hmm. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is mm-hmm. that I'm giving light to the things that are holding my family back in this continuing generational curses. And it's mm-hmm. also, you just happen to be a part of my story, but the story is not necessarily about you. Um, mm-hmm. And and when I've shared that with my family members, they're now they're more open. They're if I have a speaking engagement, they're there and they're supporting me. Um, my I have mm-hmm. family members who have bought boxes of books from me, and they're like, "This message needs to get out. Thank you for doing this." Um, mm-hmm. And at first, it was uncomfortable for you know for them, but once I yeah. started telling them that this is the thing that's that's holding us back. They mm-hmm. were really on board because they started realizing areas in their life that they needed to work on. Um, mm-hmm. And once they did that, it's, it's given them the permission to start their healing process. And my family has been extremely supportive, and they're very, um, they're very proud of me. And I think that has been um, one of the key things that has really, that is really helping my family work through a lot of the things that they have experienced. And, of course, there's still – you have those family members who still in denial, nothing's wrong with me, I'm fine, it's everybody else. But I just accept them for who they are, and some family members I have to learn to love them from a distance. But mm-hmm. um, the family members that have validated what I've gone through and who have been extremely supportive – they have really started to work on themselves, and it's been an eye-opening experience for them. Um, and so that's, I think, how um, it has really, is really, um, I think, changing the trajectory of my family because I'm the oldest of seven children, so I have six siblings who are right under me who are looking at the things that I'm doing. Um, and I, it is my hope and prayer that, you know, my openness and my transparency will inspire them to be able to talk about things that they may feel like it's something that they need to be ashamed or embarrassed about, and they realize, no, I have nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed of, of about in my life. And I tell all the time, and something that I mentioned in the book is that I may not be responsible for the trauma or the events that took place in my life or the things that I've experienced, but I am responsible for my healing. I can't go around blaming everybody for all of my problems. I when I have to take ownership, and at some point, we all have to do that. And if we don't do that, we will just continue, uh, you know, being broken. And I think about, mm-hmm. unfortunately, some of the family members that will leave this earth and that will die broken because they never took the time to address their mental health. And that's very sad when I think about that. And so I think that's why I'm talking about this. And slowly mm-hmm. but surely, you know, there are family members who are on board, and there are some who are, like, easing their way to saying, like, yeah, I, I need to work on myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's awesome. That is awesome. This, that is an incredible story because um, as you were talking, uh, the first thing that I thought was about was uh, about proof because anything that we do, if we, if I'm selling a glass of lemonade or, or, or what have you, and I'm trying to tell them that, look, this this uh, $1.25 lemonade is better than that $0.25 cent lemonade over there, I have to have proof and evidence as to uh, you know, to compel people to be able to come to my uh, lemonade stand and purchase the dollar twenty-five cent lemonade. So, by you uh, being transparent about the history of your family, I think that is going to be able to um, um, even open up greater doors 
um, for individuals to be able to, um, you know, come in and sit down and get the, uh, um, you know, I even see this thing kind of uh, even growing and getting larger. Simply, and I'm and I'm not, not just not talking about in a uh, business sector, but I'm talking about in a church setting as well because that's just some, that's the one place where we hide, we hide, we hide, we cover up, we want to prove to the world that we're squeaky clean and we're spotless and things like that. But I think this it's going to be a lot of doors that are going to be um, opened up into um, that area of you uh, teaching, training, and be able to bring more awareness to individuals. So um, what's the next chapter for you, uh, Takia, even with your podcast? What is it that you want to be able to achieve as a long-term goal um, as supporting individuals in the mental health? Or it may not be mental health. It may be uh, writing another book. So share with us uh, what, what would be your next uh, chapter step that you would like to do. Absolutely. So, um, of course, like I said, originally the podcast is Fire Friends Unite with Kia. And so the, 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 um, the, the story behind that is, uh, you know, just like fireflies, they come out at night and they use mm-hmm. their little lights to bring light into darkness. And so when mm-hmm. people are experiencing um, mental health challenges, we tend to isolate and we're in a mm-hmm. very dark place and we don't mm-hmm. see the light. And so mm-hmm. by uh, talking about the mental health conversation and normalizing it, we're bringing light into darkness. And so now it originally started as a podcast. Now Fireflies Unite is a mental health media and communications company because my background mm-hmm. is that's what I'm trained in. I went to school for communications and uh, production and media, and so I'm using all forms of di- various forms of media to – talk about mental health. So that could be, that's anything from my book, that's my podcast, that's my speaking engagement. That could be my, you know, I'm praying um, and believing God for a television show. So I'll be using Mm. all various forms of media to get the mental health message out so that people can find the way to be educated on mental health that is in a digestible way that works best for them. Some people may like podcasts, some people may like books, some people may like movies, but no matter what it is, the mental health message is getting out there. And so that's the next thing for me. Uh, my mom, you know, she often says that uh, she's like, you're, you're my little Oprah in the making. Um, but mm-hmm. I think that's the, the biggest thing for me is just really getting the mental health message out there and however way, um, whatever way um, God sees fit. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just along, uh, really, really along for the journey. And so people can expect, uh, you know, more content coming out um, and a mini documentary that I'm even uh, working working on um, really to talk about suicide among children of color um, because right now we're seeing that black children have the highest rate of suicide. So we're definitely um, in the crisis and it's getting younger and younger children that are five years Mm -hmm. old and eight years old and in their own lives. And so um, that's something that I'm very passionate about is preventing suicide among black and brown children. So you'll be seeing me do more of that work as well too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, the last question, uh, Takia, um, share with us, um, um, any uh, of how we can be able to connect with you, how we can be able to follow you, how um, they can be able to find your book, um, any upcoming uh, releases that you have, and any upcoming events that you perhaps maybe have, whether it's online training or there are live events, you can share that at this time. Yes. Um, yes. First of all, I have to just say thank you so much, Diane, for sharing your platform with me and giving me mm-hmm. a space to talk about my story. It really means a lot. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, and they can find me. My website is www.firefliesunite.com. And on social media, I am at Fireflies Pod across the board. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or they can email me, uh, Kia at FireflyesUnite.com. And that's also a way to connect with me. I am in the Washington, D.C. area, so I'm actually having a book signing um, and mental health panel um, July 7th. Um, and they mm-hmm. can, um, that will be um, from 2 to 5 p.m. at the, the Carolina Kitchen Bar and Grill. And so I'm partnering with um, a soul food black-owned restaurant who is giving mm-hmm. me the opportunity to share the space. So if they're um, interested in coming to the book signing, 
and being apart, there will be a therapist there um, that they'll be able to speak to as well. Um, they can uh, feel free to come to that event as well. Awesome. Uh, we certainly uh, would like to thank you for being our guest, taking your time out and the opportunity to be with us today uh, on the show. And, of course, we um, wish you all the best. We wish your uh, mother, your parents the best, and any other family members and any other um, individuals that are out there on the airwaves that are listening, uh, we certainly wish you the best over the triumph and overcoming of any type of mental uh, 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 issues, whether it's suicide or whether it's uh something of depression. So thank you so much for being our guest today. And as far as the listeners are concerned, for all of our upcoming events, you can go to our website at www.stpetersburgglobalministries.org. And don't forget about our upcoming event with the Women Empowerment Luncheon that's going to be held on this Saturday at June 15th. It's going to be um, at the uh, Admiralty Banquet Hall. And, of course, we impact women spiritually as as well as um, life-changing uh, ways as well. And so that will be a free luncheon for women. We always uh, like for them to come in free. We'd rather for you to be able to um, get whatever you need um, at this time without a fee that is attached. And also we'll have uh, Dr. and Pastor Sharon Webb. She's um, always have been a candidate for a lot of political offices in the Memphis, Tennessee area. And that's going to be in July on the 27th. And that's going to start at 10 o'clock as well in, at the the Admiralty Inn. The location is 8181 Highway 51 US, and that's Millington, Tennessee, 38053. We've got a lot of upcoming events that gonna, is going to be able to um, impact you uh, for your wellness, um, and uh, we just appreciate everyone for supporting our uh, digital media. Uh, we're so grateful and eternally grateful. So thanks again to Kia for your, uh, for your time uh, of sharing your uh, tremendous story that um, has really uh, um, helped me as well. Well, and it has um, hopefully it will um, be able to help the listeners. We're going to be looking to look at check the comments, um, and and uh, we're so thankful that you took the opportunity to be with us on today. Okay, thank you. Perfect. And so, till next time, you you uh, good people. We'll see you next Tuesday, and then you can go to our website and see who will be the next podcast guest. Thank you, and have a great day.